was away last week, and uh, I told Amy to cancel all the lectures, so you guys didn't didn't learn anything last week, right? No. <laughs> didn't learn anything. No? Okay, I'm going to teach you guys about something called a binary tree. <laughs> uh, I had an important business meeting to go to last week. Um, I'm just kidding. Actually, I went to Hawaii. <laughs> uh, yeah, my wife's super pregnant, and so, like... We literally just took our last trip, just the two of us, like probably ever again, you know? <laughs> so uh, it, was, it was really cool. It was really, really fun, romantic. I, I was going to show you some pictures, but I didn't have time to bring them. I'll bring them on Wednesday. But uh, the highlight of the whole trip was that we discovered on one of the Hawaiian islands there's this cat sanctuary. Because I guess there's a lot of cats loose in Hawaii because there's not a lot of predators. And this crazy cat lady, like, rounded up, like, a thousand cats and just like put them in a pen and you can just go pet all of them and my wife like the moment that she heard that that existed she was like we're going tomorrow and so we spent like a whole day just petting a thousand cats <laughs> it's a miracle I got her back to the mainland really um, anyway so that's what I've been doing I know you guys have been suffering through skip lists and binary trees and all kinds of fun things um, this week we're gonna learn about a new collection called a graph. I think graphs are really cool. They're, they're sort of a culmination of a lot of the ideas that we've seen so far in a lot of the other structures that we've learned about. So, um, you know, I'll just get right to it, I guess. And then at the end of this week, I'm going to give you homework seven, which will be about graphs, just to keep track of our schedule. Let me point out a couple things. So you guys got homework six assigned last Friday. That's up right now. Um, you can take a look at that. That's another short one where you only got a week. There's only two parts, but uh, you got a week there, and then this Friday you'll get homework seven about graphs, and the week after that is Thanksgiving. Now, I know it's sort of shitty to give you an assignment right before Thanksgiving. Um, now, just to be clear, uh, I don't particularly expect that you would work on it over your break. I hope that you go have a nice time with your family or whatever it is that you want to do. Um, the assignment's due, it's going to be due the Wednesday <coughs> night after the Thanksgiving break. So it's fine with me if you want to just completely ignore it until you get back. You'll have three or four days there that you can look at it once you're back from your vacation. That's fine. Or if you want to look at it here or here, that's fine too. It's up to you. And we always have our late days, so you can decide how to budget your time. There will be an eighth and final assignment that goes out uh, right after break that'll be due at the end of the last week and so on. So we're packing lots of more stuff in, but that's kind of the roadmap going forward, okay? So, uh, that said, let's talk about graphs. So let me open up my slides for today. And this comes from chapter 18 of the textbook, if you want to read along. So what's a graph? Well, I mean, you guys probably think of a graph as like a Cartesian, you know, XY kind of graph. That's not what a computer scientist thinks of when you say the word graph. Uh, a computer science graph is a data structure, and it contains two major components. It contains a set of vertexes, which are sometimes called nodes. And it also contains a set of connections between vertexes, which they call edges. And so when I say a set of vertexes and a set of edges, I just mean that like, you know, they're all distinct from each other. They're all unique in some way. Like there's an edge from B to C, so that's a unique thing. Sometimes some graphs you could have multiple edges between B and C, but every edge has its own identity or whatever. Um, depending what book you're looking at or what terminology you're looking at, some people call it vertexes and edges. That's what I've seen the most. That's what I'm going to refer to them as. Some people call them nodes and arcs or other things. Um, but anyway, like I think sometimes if you look through the book, you might see the word nodes occurring a lot. But they're talking about the vertexes when they say that. So um, here's an example of a graph. And uh, now why would I want something like this or why would I care about this? Well. This uh, type of structure is really useful for modeling lots of problems in computer science. So I think my next slide has some examples of that. Like uh, if you have a social network like Facebook or Twitter, you could have the people or the users be the vertexes in a graph. And the people who are friends or who follow each other, that could be like an edge between two of those vertexes. Um, you could have uh, an example I use a lot is like uh, travel, like maps, like uh, uh, flights between cities. You know, I just got back on a flight from, uh, from Maui to San Francisco. You know, you could draw edges between these cities, and that's the, that's the places that the flights fly between, you know. Um, all kinds of different things. You could do roads. 
you can even do things that might not seem, a, a lot of people think of spatial stuff, like I just said, like maps or something, but it could be something like the prerequisites of a course or something, like each course is a vertex, and you have an edge if there's a prerequisite relationship between the two courses or something like that. And then I wrote family tree, now, you might say, wait, family tree isn't a graph. That's a tree. It's, it says right there. It's called a family tree, not a family graph. Um, but yeah, maybe I'll come back to that. I mean, there's a similarity between trees and graphs. Yeah, so all kinds of things can be, can be modeled with this structure. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, we're going to spend a week on graphs. We're going to learn a fair number of things about them. But I'll just tell you that uh, there's a ton of stuff that you could learn about graphs. Um, you could spend your whole life studying them. You can get a PhD in them and do research on them. And a bunch of smart people have done a bunch of nice algorithms on graphs. And we're going to learn some of those algorithms. And one of the cool things about graphs is you start to see universality of a lot of ideas in computer science, where you have a certain problem that you're trying to solve. And if you can come up with a way to think of your problem as a graph problem, or maybe convert your data into a form that could be stored as a graph, then you have access to all these beautiful graph algorithms that smart people have made. You can run those algorithms on your problem, and then you can discover, like, oh, that's the cheapest flight to get you to your, your vacation. Or, oh, that's your, uh, your second cousin's fourth roommate is that person. Or whatever. You can, you can uh, the, the Kevin Bacon was in this movie with this person. And, oh, that person's bacon number is four. Oh, that's a graph problem. You can solve all these interesting problems if you learn about graphs. And that's a neat idea. So anyway, that's what we're going to learn about. That's the kind of the big picture here. Um, so. I do think that uh, it's interesting to think about some things that we've already thought about before and how they might be modeled as a graph. So I don't, uh, if you had a maze you were trying to escape from, you could think of like individual locations in the maze as being vertexes. And you can think of there as being an edge between vertexes if you're allowed to travel from that location to the other location. So of course there would be an edge between these neighboring squares here. But there wouldn't be an edge from here to here because there's a wall like blocking. You can't travel from here to here, something like that. Now again, why would you want to think of a maze as being a graph? Well, because there are lots of great algorithms for graphs that are already well defined, that are on Wikipedia or in your book or whatever, where you can just say, I'm here and I want to get to here. How do I do that? Run this algorithm and I'll get the answer and I'm done. So that's a nice thing. Um, also, you know, we talked about Boggle. You could think of Boggle as being a graph. You know, it doesn't seem like it is. It just seems like a grid or a two-dimensional array or something like that. But really, you could think of it as a graph where, like, the letters are vertexes, and there's an edge between if they're neighbors of each other. If there's a, if it's possible for your word search to go from here to here or from here to here, but it's not possible to jump from here down to there. So again, like, you might be searching for certain paths through the grid even if it really seems like it isn't a graph, it might be useful to think of it as one. Okay? So let's talk about some terms. Like, I'm just going to pepper you with terminology kind of quickly here. Uh, when you look through a graph, a lot of times you're interested in finding paths. Like, how do I get from here to there? And a path is formally specified as a sequence of edges or a sequence of vertexes, if you like, that gets you from one place to another. Uh, implicitly that there are edges between each neighboring pair in the path. So if I want to get from V to Z here, I can just go VXZ, or I can go VUWYXZ, or any number of other paths. Those are all valid. They have different attributes, they have different lengths, how many, how many vertexes they contain, but they're all paths from one place to the other, right? Um, these, these letters are the vertex names, and these, uh, these lowercase letters are just names for the edges. Um, so we talk about the length of a path. We also talk about vertexes that are neighbors, like V and U are neighbors, or they're adjacent to each other, or something like that. So a lot of times if you have a graph, you say, you have a graph algorithm, you'll say, well, for each of my neighbors, I want to do this or that. That would mean if I'm here, each of my neighbors would be uh, UW and X, right? Okay. So, uh, oops, what's happening? Whenever it tries to animate, it goes nuts. It, Linux doesn't like it. Um, okay, so then there's this notion of whether it's reachable to get, whether one vertex is reachable from another, that just means if you start at the one vertex, is there any path that will get you to the other vertex? So I think in this example here, every vertex is reachable from every other because they're all you know, connected by edges. And in fact, if every single vertex can reach every single other vertex, we call it a connected graph. So this one is. 
Uh, this one here is not connected because these three can't reach these two and vice versa. A complete graph is like every vertex has an edge to every other vertex. That's not super common, but it sometimes happens. So that would be like if you had an airline and they flew between every pair of cities that they flew to. Most airlines don't do that, so you know, they wouldn't have a complete graph, right? Okay. Uh, there are uh, cycles and loops, basically, are paths that go back where they started. So a cycle would be like you start at x and you move around for a while and you eventually get back to x. Typically, a, a, a definition here would say that um, you aren't allowed to reuse an edge. So you can't go like x, w, x by using the edge e twice. We sort of say like once you use an edge on that path, you've like used it up for the purpose of that path, you know? Um, so sometimes you're looking for like, does this graph have any cycles or not? Some algorithms only work on graphs that have no cycles, or some graphs are, are, are some, some algorithms are particular about cycles being present or not in a graph. So we talk about is a graph cyclic or acyclic? Does it have any cycles in it? And actually, you could write code that would look at a graph and would find out if a graph was cyclic or acyclic. You could figure that out, you know? Um, and a loop, <laughs> a loop is when a vertex literally has an edge to itself. And I think, you know, when I give this lecture, a lot of students kind of go like, wait, what? Why would you want that? Like, I think the problem is if you're thinking of a spatial analogy like these are airline flights, that would be like a flight that takes off in SFO and spins around and then lands at SFO. It's kind of stupid. Like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't buy a ticket for that flight unless you just really like those pretzels or they had those biscotti cookies now. Those are pretty good. But you could just buy a pack of those at Trader Joe's or something and save some money. So, yeah, you wouldn't do a flight to yourself uh, in a... Um, in a model like that, but like there are some examples of graphs where it might be might make sense to be able to have a self edge. Like sometimes on a messaging program, you can friend yourself and send a message to yourself. It lets you do that for testing purposes. So that would be like a self edge or something like that, or whatever. There's lots of examples where you might allow that or not. But actually, a lot of graphs just disallow that. If you try to add an edge between the same vertex and itself, it'll it'll forbid that. Okay. So those are cycles and loops. Uh, and so let's talk about some variations of graphs, some different properties graphs can have or not have. Some graphs are what are called weighted graphs. A weighted graph is when the edges have some sort of number or cost or weight associated with them. Now, what does the weight mean? Well, it could mean anything. It depends what the data is, right? So in this example, this is a bunch of airports. And I think that the numbers here are supposed to indicate the mileage between those cities. I don't, I don't remember where I got these. Uh, doodles from, so I don't remember if that's accurate at all or whatever. Maybe somebody just made up numbers here, but um, mileages. So that's how many miles to fly from here to there. Okay, well, some graphs have weights and some don't. One way that you could think of it, like if you want to sort of simplify things, you could think of it as like if a graph doesn't have any weights at all, you could think of it as they all have a weight, but they're all the same weight. So there's no difference of one's weight from the others. Some people define that to all be a weight of one or all be a weight of zero or something like that. But anyway, um, a lot of times, but not always, a graph will require the weight to be non-negative. And of course, if you're thinking of example like an airline, you can't fly negative miles unless you're like in the upside down and Stranger Things or something. <coughs> maybe, maybe the flights down there are negative miles. I don't know, but like you, you have to fly a non-negative number of miles to get from a city to another city. Some graphs allow negative weights. Um, I can't think of an example off the top of my head of a graph that would have that, but some do. So yeah, I mean, this example has the weights be mileages. Can you think of any other, if it was airline flights, can you think of any other things that might be like the weight? What, sorry, what? Cost. Yeah, just the monetary cost. Like if you want to buy a <laughs> ticket to fly from here to there, maybe this flight here will cost you 200 bucks and maybe this flight will cost you 100 bucks. So I mean, I think implicitly the reason that you would maybe store weights is you might be searching for a path that has a low weight. Uh, I want, if the, if, the, if the edges are the uh, monetary cost, maybe I'm searching on Expedia or Kayak or whatever website, I want the cheapest flight to get from here to there, right? Or uh, if it is mileage, maybe, maybe I want the lowest mileage. Like maybe there's a great deal on flying like all the way around like this to get to Miami, but maybe that's ridiculous because it would take me like 10 hops or 10, 10 different uh, 
you know, stops at intermediate airports to get to where I want to go. So maybe I don't want to do that. So depending what the weights are, you might be optimizing for one thing versus another. Bless you. Okay, so that's a weighted graph. Any, any questions so far about any of this stuff? Just mostly concepts, terminology. Pretty simple stuff, right? Some graphs are what we call directed graphs. A directed graph means that the edges only go one way. So this picture here, I mean, typically we draw it as little arrowheads. So like A has an edge that goes to B, but it only travels that way. If you want to go from B to A, there doesn't happen to be an edge to do that. So you can't go that way. But I mean, sometimes you can get there, but you just have to go a different way. Like maybe you could go B, D, C, A. You could get to A maybe, but just not directly through an edge, right? This might be more applicable for plane flights Maybe the flights really do just travel one direction. There might be flights that happen to go both ways. You can have edges that go both ways in a directed graph. It's just we kind of think of it as being two different edges, each of them being one way. And you might have both or not. So and I, think, I think the analogy here, like if you want to think about different examples of graphs and when would they be directed, when would they be not directed. I mean, I like the example of Facebook versus Twitter. So like if Facebook is your graph, when you friend somebody on Facebook, it is reciprocal. You both friend each other, right? There's no, I guess they now have like celebrities that you can like follow, but that's they're basically just copying Twitter, right? So like if you typically have a friend that you make, you friend each other. And that's, that's like both directions, right? But on Twitter, you know, I can follow uh, Scarlett Johansson or whatever, and she doesn't seem to want to follow me back. So that's like a one directional graph. One, uh, it's a directed graph, that, that example, right? And of course, these things can be mixed and matched. You can have a weighted directed graph or an unweighted directed graph. All these things can be used in combination, right? So uh, I mentioned earlier that you might have courses that were prerequisites. Maybe the prereqs are, are, are represented as edges, right? So you have like 106A and you have 106B and you have edges between them or whatever. So uh, I think it's an interesting example. I don't think I have a slide on this, do I? Wait, let me check this real quick. Do I have a slide on the, the Stanford courses? I think I don't. Okay. Um, so, like, what if you were going to represent Stanford courses as as a graph? Let me. I'm just going to pop up this Notepad program just so I can get a white background. So, if you had like you know CS106A, and then you had like CS106B or X or whatever, I think what a lot of people are tempted to do is they go, okay, that's a vertex. And then after 106A, you can take 106B, so they draw out like that, right? It seems pretty simple, like you go that way, you take A and then you go there, right? But um, what I want to point out is sometimes the direction, sometimes you want to think about it a different way. You might want to store it as like point from a class to all the things that it depends on. Now you might say, well, what's the difference? Does it really matter? Why would you want it that way? I think the thing is like, Sometimes after taking a class, there's suddenly like 87 classes you could take. And so now there's all these arrows shooting out of there all over the place. And that's kind of messy. But usually a one given class will have two or three direct prereqs at the most. So that will maybe keep your graph a little bit cleaner. Do you know what I mean? Like I don't, I don't know exactly what all that is at Stanford. But like maybe after A, there's a whole bunch of stuff you could take after that. Whoa, it's like a tentacle monster. But, um, but maybe if we just keep it a little simpler here and we stop it. Uh, get out of here. <laughs> Whenever I draw too far to the left, my whole computer gets confused. That's it. I'm going to burn the whole thing down. <laughs> okay, sorry. sorry. Um, anyway, sometimes it makes sense to do the um, edges in the other order. So I think maybe what my general advice here is like I see students maybe over spatialize their thoughts about graphs. They think of graphs as like I'm physically standing here and if I go on that edge I'm going to walk over there or I'm going to fly over there which sometimes is totally what the graph means but sometimes not. So you just want to think about exactly what the vertexes are, exactly what the edges are, why do I want the edges, what am I going to do with the edges and so on. Because probably what you want from this graph Think about it for a second. Why do you want this graph? What are we even doing? I mean, I just made this up, right? But like, why, why would we have this? Well, I'm probably using it to check whether you're allowed to enroll in a class or not. I mean, I know Stanford is weird and they don't check these things. You could just sign up for whatever if you want, right? But imagine we were at a university that cared about prerequisites. So you want to sign up for 106B and X. So if I'm like writing my computer program, I sort of go to that vertex and I go, well, am I allowed to take this class or not? 
Well, I probably want to go walk to all the prerequisites. Like if there's a math prereq, if there's some other prereq, I want to go look at those and see if you have taken them, right? Like what do I care if after B and X you could do these four things? I don't care. That's not what I'm coding right now. I don't care what you could take next. Maybe if that's what I care about, maybe I do want to flip the graph around. So anyway, it just depends what you're doing, right? So yeah, prereqs and courses, directed graph. Directions do matter there, right? So, okay, now I mentioned earlier that a family tree was kind of like a graph, but of course it's called a tree, so what's up with that? Well, linked lists of trees are both graphs. They're both just carefully restricted subsets of graphs. A binary tree is a graph that is directed and it's acyclic, because if you have a pointer back to the root or something, that's not right. You know, you can't point back up in a tree. So it's directed and acyclic with a few other constraints like you can have an outward, we call it degree, is how many edges you have coming in or out of your vertex. So you can have an inward degree of at most one, somebody pointing at you, and you can have an outward degree of at most two. And there's exactly one way to get to every node, like there's not an edge from this guy over to there or something like that. Um, a few other little restrictions, but that's basically what a binary tree is, it is a graph. And like this is also a graph with even more uh, restrictions, that you can only have an out degree and in degree of at most one. So yeah, these are specializations. So they bring in some stuff kind of all together here. So, so of course what you're thinking is, ah, shit, that means I'm not done with pointers and recursion yet, am I? You are correct. Uh, yeah, graphs are, uh, a lot of algorithms on graphs are recursive because you say, well, I'm at a vertex, so do this and then recursively do it to my neighbor also and search from there too. And, and a lot of the nodes and edges are kind of pointers between things and so, uh, a lot of these algorithms look a little like tree algorithms like you've been learning last week with the, with the TAs, gave the guest lectures. So that's cool. Um, now, I wanted to uh, show you there's a class in our Stanford library that is a graph that you can use. I want to play with it just for a minute or two just to see how it works. And then I just, I think that that would show us like, oh, there's some problems you can solve with this. This is a useful object. We're gonna learn later this week, like, well, how does it work? How do, how, do you, how do you implement a graph? You know, like, I'll show you how to use one first. So there's a class in our library called basic graph. And if you declare a basic graph, you know, most of the collections, you put like a bracket, like what type, is it a graph, or is it a, is it a vector of strings or a, a hash set of ints or whatever. With a basic graph, you don't really have to specify any type in the brackets because like implicitly the type of data that you're storing is like vertexes and edges. And vertexes are often referred to by strings which are their names. And edges can also have names if you want them to. So if you make a basic graph, it starts out as not having any vertexes or edges in it, but you can add vertexes and then after you have added vertexes, you can add edges between them. And uh, it's a directed weighted graph so if you add an edge AC, it adds just directed from A to C only in that one direction. Yeah. Why would you use string instead of pointers? Oh, why wouldn't I use pointers? Yeah. There are some pointers here I'm gonna show you in a minute, but basically I think the goal of this guy is to make it so that mostly you can avoid pointers and, unless you need them. Like, I think it's easier to say, well, these are all cities, so I'll make a vertex called Miami. And then I wanna ask for all the cities that are neighbors of Miami as opposed to like this star variable pointer thingy that I have. It's just, it's kind of like there's pointers inside here and I'll show you how to look in and look at them. But mostly this guy's managing these, these vert like when I say add vertex, it goes in and makes some little pointery noty things inside of there for you that you can talk to later if you want to. Yeah. So when we're talking about graphs, it doesn't seem like any of the vertices are like identified and different from each other in some way. But when we looked at the example of like representing a tree with a graph, one of those vertices, like we have to call the left one, one of those we have to call the right one. Is there some terminology on a graph where like, we're labeling different edges that are connected to it, different things? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll sort of partially repeat just so the video records. Uh, you're asking like, if a graph was being used to represent a tree, how would I remember or track, like this one's the root, this one's the left or the right? I would say like, just practically speaking, I don't, I'm not going to actually code that way. I'm not going to go code a tree using a graph. I just want you to see that conceptually a tree is by definition a subset of the set of all graphs. And so some of the things that we can learn about graphs are also true of trees and vice versa. Um, but yeah, like I think practically speaking, if we know that we're dealing with a binary tree, we should write code that's more 
targeted to that and not try to write a graph <laughs> algorithm that happens to be running on something that's a binary. You know, like mostly if we know we're dealing with a linked list, let's write linked list code. But it's interesting to see that linked lists are graphs. So for example, I mean, the main reason I show you this slide is like partly like, oh, there's some bigger themes here. And also partly like, oh, if there's ever something we prove that is true about all graphs, then we will know that that thing is also true about all binary trees and all linked lists. Or if we come up with some awesome algorithm that does something to a graph, theoretically that algorithm should be possible to run on a tree or linked list as well. So it's more of a conceptual theoretical kind of a point. Anyway, that's a basic graph. You can include basic graph.h. Here's some of the methods a basic graph has. I mean, it's fairly <coughs> self-explanatory. Like you can add vertices and edges. You can remove all of them. You can ask for all the edges and loop over them. I think this returns a set, a set of edges here. You can ask for who are the neighbors of a given vertex. Who, who are the vertices that you could reach directly via an edge from this vertex? Um, and yeah, you can, there's a bunch of other things. Are these two vertexes neighbors of each other, et cetera? You can add and move. You can print the graph out and it'll print all the vertexes and stuff. Um, yeah, so there's that. Uh, Here's uh, another thing. Uh, you were talking about pointers a minute ago. So technically, when you add a vertex, when you say add vertex, the letter C, it technically goes inside there and it makes this little struct called a vertex struct. And the vertex struct kind of keeps internal information about the vertex. And if you want to access that thing, you can say get vertex C. So you pass the name of the vertex and it'll return you this pointer to this thing. And that structure has its name, and it also has a set of all the outbound edges that come out from that vertex. There's a few other members in there as well. So like, if you want to talk to these vertexes as pointers, you can. But when you add them, you add them by using a string as a name. So. I'm confused, so, but why is it like in a set? Is there even why it's not a hash set? Oh, why isn't this a hash set? Yeah. Uh, I believe it's because if you make it a set, it sorts them by the name of the neighbor. And that way, when you for each over them, You'll get the neighbors in alphabetical order. I think the designer of the library, who's partially me and partially Eric Roberts, decided that would be nice if it looped over them in ABC order. So that's basically why. Yeah, and then, and then you can also get an object representing an edge. So you say, I want to get the edge from A to C. I want to get the struct of information about that edge. And in there is like a pointer to the vertex it starts at and a pointer to the vertex that it ends at and a couple of other things. So. Um, yeah. In fact, I think uh, there's, a, there's a field here I probably should have listed. There's a double in here for like a weight. So if you want to set the edge to have a weight, you can get this thing and put the weight in there and stuff. But anyway, a uh, little bit of pointery stuff inside the graph, which we won't use right away, but that can be useful later. Okay, so I just wanted to do a quick little problem with you guys. Uh, I mentioned like social networks can be graphs. So imagine I have a file full of uh, Twitter follow relationships. Each line contains two strings, two words. And each word represents a username on Twitter. So if it says name one, name two, that means name one follows name two. So I want to know who's the coolest person in the whole file. <laughs> and I've chosen a very particular definition of cool, because I'm getting old, so I don't really know what cool is anymore. So uh, I uh, define cool as to be who has the most followers of followers. So it's like if you have four friends, but then those four friends have 100 friends, then you have a coolness rating of 100. So I want to see who has the most coolness points, OK? And I want to do it using a, um, a basic graph. Yeah? So um, in basic graphs, are the edges undirected? The edges are directed, yeah. So if you add an edge from A to B, it only goes that way. And, and Twitter, this is meant to be Twitter, where Twitter does have a directional uh, follow model. If it were Facebook and I wanted a bidirectional, I didn't really say this, but if you, if you want a bi-directional edge, or like both ways, you can add edge BC and add edge CD. So that essentially gets you one edge going both uh, ways, basically. Okay. So let's do this using basic graph. Uh, I've got a cute creator project here. Boy, I don't know. It's been a week. I don't know if I remember how to code any C++ anymore. <laughs> What's an isStream? Is that the one that does the bits or the bytes? Oh, no, no, that's a Huffman thing. Never mind. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm going to open up a file, and I'm going to run coolest, and I'm going to see who's the cool person, and I'm going to print it out. So we have to write this coolest thing. So look, I'll do the hard part. I think I need a basic graph named graph. OK, now what? Now remember, <laughs> remember each line of this file 
is like this. It has a couple of names. Stuart follows Marty, Helen follows Elmer, and so on. So remember that I want, I want to know who has the most followers of followers. So maybe you can help me out. In this graph, what are the vertexes and what are the edges? Okay, the vertexes are the people, the users, yeah? And the edges are the following relationships. Okay, sure. So um, I think I can do sort of the I.O. part of this. Um, so let's do string name one and then uh, name two. And then while I'm able to read from the input a name one and a name two. Did you know you can use that syntax? While I'm able to read two words from the input. Uh, then I think what you're saying is you want me to add both of those people to the graph. So graph.add vertex. By the way, I just want to point out when you start typing like .add, uh, the library has, you can call it a vertex or a node, or you can call it an edge or an arc. I couldn't, Eric Robertson, I couldn't agree on what to call them. And I was really adamant, like vertex edge, vertex edge. And Eric Roberts is like, they're clearly nodes and arcs. And so, I was like, oh, did you get your animals two by two on Nova's arc or something like that? I don't know. Anyway, so, uh, um, no, anyway, Eric's smarter than me and has more power than me, so he got his nodes and arc, but he agreed to let me also add one called add vertex and add edge. So I'm going to use those. Add vertex, name one. <laughs> uh, don't tell him I added these methods. I'll burn this part of the video. So um, add both of those vertexes, and then you said that the edge is like the following relationship, so do you want me to do like graph.add edge? Name one, name two, like name one is following name two. And make sure that it's harder to search for. Harder to search, what do you mean? Maybe, might be on something. We care about who has the most followers of followers, so we want to be very quickly able to, given somebody, tell you who their followers are. So maybe we want to point from somebody to their followers. Okay, yeah, so uh, he, I think he's on to something. He said, um, so like I'm trying to draw you a crappy picture again. So here's Scar jo, Scarlett Johansson. And then like, you know, I follow her, maybe, hypothetically. I just like that uh, Black Widow movie, that's all. Um, and uh, maybe I'm followed by our TA, Amy. She, I don't think she follows me on Twitter. I'm not cool enough. But, but like, if I'm interested in learning more about Scar jo, and how many followers of followers she has. You know, you might say, well, Amy follows Marty, so that's an edge, and then Marty follows ScarJo, so that's an edge. But really, I'm gonna be looking at ScarJo trying to learn outward from her, who follows her, and then who follows those people. So I think you might be right that maybe the way I wanna do this is maybe I wanna point who is ScarJo followed by, and who is Marty followed by. Even though that doesn't match our conception of the social network, we're only using this graph to answer this particular question, so maybe, maybe I should reverse the edges. And actually what you could do, so I think, I think you're right, name two, name one, you understand? An edge from name two to name one, that's from uh, ScarJo to Marty here. And if that's confusing, then you might wanna put a comment here that's like, you know, it goes from person to who follows them or something like that. That's what the edges do. Or you could even rename this to like is followed by or something descriptive like that, okay? So add those vertexes and add those edges. Um, I forget what the graph does if that vertex is already there and you try to add it again. So we're gonna see some dupes like A follows B and A follows C. So I, I don't forget if it throws an error if you uh, add no, let me just look at what it does. Uh, if it's already there, just vertex already exists, so just return it. Okay, so it'll it'll just silently not do anything if we try to add a duplicate. Yeah. Wait, so uh, is there is, is the reason loading name two is first and name one second, or, or like could we do the opposite? Well, I was just doing it for this, so that ScarJo is name two and I'm name one, so I just want the edge to go that way. <laughs> If we switched it, then I think it will be in a minute when we write the rest of the code, I think it will be harder to figure out outward from ScarJo who follows her. So um, that's why I think we want it this way. So okay, now at this point, I think we'll have all the people. I could just do C out graph endl just to see if it's working, I guess. And yeah, I mean, it's a little hard to read, but it's like here's all the vertexes. And then like Donald, follow, Donald is followed by Maron. Is that true? Uh, Donald is followed, it should say Maron, Don yeah, Donald is followed by, okay, I think it's working. So, um, cool, we've got a graph, now we need to know who has the most followers of followers. 
So this part is like read <coughs> file into graph, and then it's like learn who has most followers of followers. Fof. I guess. How do I do that? I know you're just learning this library, but maybe you could describe kind of conceptually what I need to do. Yeah? For um, to uh, avoid duplicate uh, followers of followers, you could do for each um, for each node that is adjacent to okay, so you so you first loop over all of the nodes in the graph and to find the maximum. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, loop over inside the Inside of each of those, um, you look inside of each of its adjacent nodes and. It, if you add, if you add each adjacent, adjacent nodes into a set, and if, and if the size of that set <coughs> is larger than uh, the maximum, it is the maximum, and then at the end you return the maximum. Okay, got it. So I, there's there's a couple things in there. Let me unpack that a little bit. Um, so. This is a maximization problem. So any maximization problem, you sort of say, for each thing, figure out its value. And then if that's the most I've ever seen, then remember that thing. And then at the end, return the most I've ever So the maximization problem is fairly straightforward. But how do I like compute the numbers for each of these people? And you described that as well. You said that um, if I'm looking at ScarJo, maybe, then I look out to her followers, and I look out to their followers, and I want to gather up all those people, I don't want duplicates, so maybe I throw them all in a set and I see how many names are in the set after I do all of that and that'll tell me how many foffs this person has. Yeah, so something like this, I think. Um, for each vertex V in the graph.get vertex set, so it doesn't loop over the string names of the vertexes, it loops over these little pointery things. If you want the name of the vertex, you can say V name. So that's the name of each person or whatever. So for each person, I want to loop over all the people that follow that person. So to get the people that follow a person, those are the ones it has an edge outward to, right? So um, to get the people that, that, are, that, are, uh, that have an edge, you say graph.getNeighbors of V. That's a set of those people. So then I want like for each vertex neighbor in that, so now I'm looping, the neighbors are people like, uh, so V in this example, like ScarJo is, um, is V, and then neighbor is like Marty in this example, right? So now I want the people who are followers of Marty. <laughs> so I wanna go one more level deeper here, right? Uh, so I think what I'm doing here is I wanna, I wanna count off of this vertex V. So maybe what I'll do is I'll make a set of strings of like foffs, <laughs> empty, and then for each neighbor, that neighbor has a set of followers, so like for each vertex foff in graph.get neighbors of the neighbor, right? <laughs> Fofs dot add fof name, right? Does that make sense? V is Scarjo, neighbor is me, Fof is whoever's <laughs> stupid enough to follow me, and then that person's name, put them in a set, gather them all up. Size of the set is how many Fofs you have. Uh, yeah, question? How do you talk about time complexity in the context of graphs? Like, is, it, is N the size of the vertexes or the edges? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Like, what about big O, right? Because I'm trying to pitch that this is all connected. So what about that the topic from the course? Um, I'm going to come to it probably Wednesday. I mean, you don't talk about N anymore. They're, big O is still important in graphs. You still talk about big O a lot. But you have your vertexes and you have your edges. So sometimes you talk about this is big O of V, the number of vertexes you have. Or this is big O of V times E. 
because it has to do with not only how many vertexes you have, but how many neighbors a vertex might have would indicate how much that loop would go. And so, yeah, you'll have an algorithm on a graph that's like v squared log e or something like that. And so both of those are kind of like ends that are part of the big O expression. And I think actually it's an interesting example because um, you know, you get so conditioned to say big O is something followed by n, but not every problem has an individual single variable that it is proportional to. So that's a good example of that. Um, anyway, so I have some number of FOFs here, and then the FOFs dot size is how many FOFs this person has. So I think what I want is I want like uh, int max FOFs equals zero, and string cool name equals empty. Like I, I need to remember who's the coolest person I've seen so far, right? So then something like if FOFs dot size is greater than max FOFs, then Right, this is the maximization part you talked about. So then max fofs equals fofs dot size. And then cool name is this person's name, which is V's name, right? And then when I'm done, I don't have to see out the graph anymore. I'll return the cool person's name. Get it? Something like that. Uh, let's try it. So, <laughs> the coolest person is Donald. Hmm. Well, I know there's a Donald on Twitter who has a lot of followers, but that wasn't really my plan here. Um, <laughs> is he cool? I don't know. Uh, is Donald the coolest? I guess I don't, it's hard to check this because it's followers of followers. So actually, wait, only Meron follows Donald, right? Wait, is that right? Two people follow Meron. Two people follow Meron. Stuart follows Meron and Marty follows Meron. So then, doesn't that mean Donald has two FOFs? Is that right? That, that doesn't seem right. Did we mess up? Was anyone forward? No forward. Here, I tell you what. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you what. Printing is good, right? Let me just make sure. I feel like this is wrong. Uh, C out. Uh, v name has uh, FOFs are FOFs. Handle. So then I'm going to get a bunch of like foffy printouts here. Here. Does that look right? Uh, no. Meron, for example, has. Yeah. No. It says Marty. Marty is right. See, I've done this example before, and I thought the right answer was Meron, because I thought I, I like to. Whenever I have Meron in the example, I always like to make him like the best one, because <laughs> he signs off on my pay raises. So I figure I'm like, hey, Meron's great. He's got lots of coolness to him. Um, I mean, he does. He is equally also cool. the coolest. But I thought he had three. I thought the data set was going to have him have three. I've got another uh, file. I've got a couple other input files. Uh, if I don't see, if, I don't know if it's wrong or not, but um, no, I, I is right. it right? Wait, yeah. okay, go back to the data. <laughs> Wait, let's, let's find how many followers Marty has. Yeah, it's Marty and Stuart. So Marty and Stuart follow Marty. Stuart follows Marty, Marty. 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 I see, so it's it's the no dupes. No, so what no, if. Maron should have three followers. Maron should have three followers. Who are his fofs? Because Donald follows Stuart, so that's one fof. Mm -hmm. And Marty follows Meron, and oh. Stuart follows Marty, Donald follows yeah. Marty. Well, but Donald so, but, yeah. Yeah. Okay, how about Reed follows Stuart? Shouldn't that tip the tide? Uh, uh, let's try it again. Is, is Stuart Oops. Oh. So that should give, that should give, oh, uh, Marty's the coolest. <laughs> 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 Well, well, well. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> um, I, the main purpose of this example is I just kind of wanted to like play with this library a little bit and and like look, uh, if you're a cynic or a practical person, you might say, ah, I could have solved this problem with a hash map or something. And yeah, sure, fine, okay, you can. But some problems feel like graph problems, and once you learn about graphs, sometimes you start saying, oh. 
if I use a graph for this, I know exactly what to do. I'll just search for the nearest neighbor of blah, 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 and then I'll be done. And so like, it's just another tool in the toolbox that works really well for certain kind of problems. I think this is one of them. But anyway, I'm going to move on. I, I think this looks like it's working. But uh, I want to talk about, um, I'm not going to finish this. There's a couple of things I want to talk about about searching for paths. And I think I'll get through one of them today, and I'll resume on Wednesday. Uh, I want to talk about two searching algorithms. Again, I'll probably only get to the first one. It's called depth first search. The goal here is how do I find a path in a graph? Well, it depends what you're trying to do. Sometimes all you want to know is can I get from place A to place B, vertex A to vertex B? Sometimes that's all you want. Are they reachable? Other times you want like the shortest possible path. What's the minimum number of hops? I think airline analogies work pretty well here. I want a nonstop flight, shortest path. Or you say, I don't care if I have to fly to Vegas as a layover. If it's cheaper, I'll do that over the nonstop. I'm not willing to pay 150 extra bucks for the nonstop flight. So sometimes you optimize weight or cost versus length of path, right? So I think airline is a good example for that. So I think in this data, I'm not going to look at it, but I'm pretty sure in this data, the shortest path from Miami to Etc. is different than the minimum cost uh, path. But because I think there's a direct why? No, there's not. Uh, you could, if you flew to um, Honolulu and then to SFO, it's a two hop. It's the fewest hops. But that's like way more expensive than if you just flew to Dallas and then LAX, right? I think that's the answer to that. But OK, so one algorithm, well-known algorithm, for looking for a path in a graph is called a depth-first search. The idea is that you um, start at a vertex. And from there, you go as deep as possible, seeing where you can get from here. And if from here you can reach the destination, there's your path. And so when I say deep, what I mean is like you start here and you pick a way to go, and you go as far that way as you can get before you give up and try a different way. So uh, like, look, here's the actual algorithm. If you're trying to run a DFS, maybe this is a function, of parameters of vertex one, vertex two then uh, a lot of these algorithms involve marking a vertex as being visited, because you don't want to get in a cycle where you're like getting back to the place you started, right? So mark the vertex that's visited, and then once you've done that, for each of the unvisited neighbors, the ones that are not marked as visited, you try to recursively do a depth first search from that neighbor to the destination. And if you find a destination, then you did it, then hooray. If not, you try the next neighbor. <coughs> What does this sort of look like in terms of the course material that we've learned about? What kind of course concepts are in this code here? Yeah. Recursive backtracking. This is recursive backtracking, yes. Because you, for each neighbor, you choose that neighbor, you explore where you can get from that neighbor, and if it doesn't get you there, you unchoose and back up and try the next one. It's totally recursive backtracking. I mean, you can see the recursion right here because I literally call my function. But like, you know, the, the notion of like looking for a successful state and then if it's unsuccessful, trying another one, that's very much a backtracking algorithm. Now, in terms of what you'll find with this algorithm, depth first search, again, the reason it's called depth first search is like you pick an unvisited neighbor. I mean, just like with backtracking, you pick a thing and you explore all the stuff that could follow that choice. You explore all of that before you come back and try a different choice, right? So. What does that say about the path that you're going to find? Like, if you did a depth first search on this graph, and when I say for each neighbor, assume that that emits the neighbors in alphabetical order, what you would do if you were searching from A to F is you would first try B, and then you would try D, and then you would try E. And so if you first tried B, that would get you to E, and that would get you to F, right? So you would end up with A, B, E, F. But you wouldn't notice that there was an AEF. The algorithm wouldn't discover that. So this algorithm is not guaranteed to find the shortest possible path. I'm going to stop, but on Wednesday, I'll talk about a different algorithm called breadth-first search that will find the shortest path. That will also look familiar from previous course material. Anyway, have a great afternoon. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Thanks.